when Cambodian forces seized an American cargo ship off Koh Tang Island in May 1975, a rescue squad of 11 U.S. helicopters was sent to retrieve its crew. The extraction started and all hell broke loose. Um, the first helicopter came in and, and just the, the amount of gunfire in both directions was just unbelievable. The fighting was so chaotic that three Marines were left behind and disaster struck. On the way into the island, we tried to land at first, but unfortunately we could not. There was so much gunfire coming, rockets being shot at us, actually RPGs. Cambodian forces shot down a CH-53 helicopter carrying 26 American souls. Soft Stories Live features guests who are often decades removed from an operation, so the stories are told as they remember them and are not cleared for release by the Department of Defense. All content discussed is unclassified and or publicly released by the DOD prior to this broadcast. Our intent is to share these moments in history as experienced by the special operators who were there. Good afternoon. I'm Chief Master Sergeant Randy Anderson, U.S. Air Force retired, former Air Commando, and the host for today's SS Maguez in 14 hours on Kotang Island, part one. Thank you for joining us. Today's Soft Stories Live is honored to welcome two U.S. Air Force retired Air Commandos. Major General U.S. Air Force retired Rich Comer and Colonel U.S. Air Force retired Gary Weichel, who were part of the U.S. Air Force H-53 helicopter assault force. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome to Soft Stories Live, and thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Before we get started, I'd like to give the audience a little bit of a backstory on this subject in case they're not familiar with it. On 12 May 1975, Khmer Communist gunboat seized the SS Wamaguez a container ship in international waters in the Gulf of Thailand. The ship was captured some 60 miles southwest of Cambodia. 39 crew members were sub su subsequently taken hostage. Attempts at negotiating release of the crew was fruitless, prompting a military response. U.S. military forces were directed to board and seize the SS Maguez and recover any crew members being held on the Koteng Island, Cambodia. Originally, 7th Air Force drew up an assault plan for the Maguez involving U.S. Air Force Security Police from the 56th Security Police Squadron, Nekong Phnom Air Base, Thailand. The original plan was to place 75 personnel and retake the ship on 14 May. Was, that was quickly canceled when the 21st SOS CH-53C Knife 13 3 transporting 18 security police and a crew of five crashed en route, tragically killing all on board, prompting command authorities to scrap those plans. The 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, BL-229, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Randall Austin, was then in a training exercise on Okinawa, and it received orders on the night of 13 May to return to camp and prepare for departure by air at dawn on 14 May. On the morning, 14 May, uh, BL-229 boarded the U.S. Air Force 141s at Kadena and flew to Thailand. Its mission, board and seize the SS Maguez, assault Koh Tang Island to recover the crew. 9th Marine Regiment has been the first U.S. ground combat force committed to the Vietnam War in, in 1965, but in May of 1975, only a few officers and non-commissioned officers had seen actual combat in Vietnam. U.S. Navy warships Coral Sea, Harold E. Hulk, and Henry B. Wilson were all scheduled to arrive on station 15 May, but none of these ships carried any troops. However, these ships would become pivotal as the staging platforms needed to support a three-wave assault, 230 U.S. Marines, and rearming refueling operations. In the pre-dawn hours of 15 May 1975, six HH-53C Jolly Green Giants of the 40th Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Squadron and five CH-53C knife aircraft of the 21st Special Operations Squadron unloaded the Marines. Three HH-53s were intended for retaking the Maguez. The remaining aircraft mission were to insert the Marines on the east and west beaches of the northern part of the island to secure it and rescue the crew believed to be held there. Gentlemen, let's start first with General Comer. General Comer, what was your rank, crew position, and squadron when you first learned you were going to be used on this operation? I was a, a second lieutenant, and I had been in Thailand for four months, and uh, was a hard crew, 
with a captain named Barry Walls, who was, uh, and the, we under military airlift command in the rescue service, when you arrived, we were hard, placed on a crew and I was hard crewed with him. I flew with him almost the whole time. Our flight engineer who I flew with almost my whole tour in Thailand was Jesse De Jesus. And so we knew each other pretty well. The PJs in our crew would rotate. So, uh, but that's, you know, I was young and pretty uh, uninformed about how these things go. You're right. Uh, Colonel Weichel, uh, please introduce yourself, sir. Same question. Uh, and go ahead. Uh, I was a very senior first lieutenant there. Uh, and, uh, I was uh, I was a co-pilot on the Jolly Green 1-1, uh, both uh, and uh, Jolly Green 1-1 was the standardization evaluation crew. Don Backlund was the aircraft commander. He was the uh, first lieutenant, also a uh, couple weeks senior to me. But he had uh, he had had, a, he would, had two tours over there flying H-53s. He was standardization evaluation. He was kind of the de facto commander of the squadron, in my personal view. Uh, and uh, the rest of the crew, and I had just completed before the Cambodian evacuation, I had just completed my aircraft commander upgrade ride. And for whatever reason, that standardization evaluation crew wanted me as their co pilot uh, for both uh, Phnom Penh evacuation, uh, where we took battle damage going in and out, and things like this to, in, in, to insert the come back control team in the back. And then, so I, I, I was also with them again with Harry Cash, flight, flight engineer. Once again, a flight examiner, flight engineer. And with a very super senior PJ crew, uh, John Eldridge, Silver Stars, Stu Stanland, Silver Stars. Uh, we had the pretty much the A team that you could possibly have in terms of combat experience. And we felt pretty good after having been uh, beat up and bloodied a little bit on the non pen thing. And frankly, we were kind of excited uh, to let the, the CH-53 guys, the 21st, go and see a little bit of action because at the time we didn't think there was going to be much to this with only 13 possibly bad guys on now that we thought this was going to right. get, be over pretty quick. So uh, at that point, uh, uh, I was with them for that, and we flew for about a little over 14 hours, I think 14.3 to 14.7 hours that day as Jolly Green 1-1. And of course, our job was to lead the entire 11 ships down to the uh, an IP at the island where uh, we broke off to go to the Holt, and then the uh, CHs broke off to go to the island assault. Uh, thank you, Colonel Weichel. I appreciate that. Uh, General Comer, could you please give a brief explanation of why the Air Force 53s were used instead of the Marine or Navy Aviation Forces and, and, and the type of squadrons used? I, I know there's a, a, a lot of questions surround that. Why not use Navy Aviation or Marine Aviation to support this? Op? Why, why, why did you guys get called? We were available and we were the only ones there. That uh, in Thailand at the time, the only thing that was active were some Air Force bases, and they had been kept there in order to facilitate the eventual evacuation of Phnom Penh and Saigon if those things came, uh, came up. And both of them did, and they came up in April. The 12th of April had been the evacuation of Phnom Penh. The, the, 29th, 30th of April was the evacuation of, of Saigon. And the 21st Special Ops Squadron was nine CH-53s, all at Nakhon Phanam, Thailand. Right. Nakhon Phanam was the far northeast corner of, of Thailand, close right on the Mekong River. Uh, Laos on the other side, and it was the closest base to North Vietnam for flying rescue during the Vietnam War. I see. So it was the quickest route, but there were no Navy or Marine aviation assets available. The closest ones were farther away than the Philippines. And so they uh, grabbed the Marines that were training and the Philippines and started sending them toward Utapau 
air base on the southern uh, shore of Thailand, and they sent us all down there. Now that happened on the 13th. We didn't get uh, told to move or to go until about dinner time on the 13th. I see. We were ordered to send helicopters down to Utapau. It was a four hour flight. And we would take with us security police because if we had to do the mission on the 14th, the only ground soldiers available that, could, that had guns were the people that provided air base security around the Thai bases. And so they were gonna combine the security police of Nakhon Phanom and the ones at Utapau and constitute out of that a ground force to go and because they, they expected their Tang Island, that there was nothing uh, much to oppose us. The ship was parked there beside the island. They assumed that the crew of the ship was on the island or on the ship. I see. And so that's why we were gonna go there and why they thought we would be not strongly opposed. So if it happened on the 14th, we were just going with security police, air, you know, sky cops. Um, and if it was delayed to the 15th, that would be enough time for the Marines to get to Utapau, join up with the helicopters, and go out to perform the mission. Now, the, I was on the first flight of H-53s to leave Nikon Phanom and to arrive at Utapak. We were flight lead. We had uh, two H-53s with us. We thought our mission would be to perform SAR support, search and rescue support for the 21st SOS to perform the mission of actually taking the troops out to the island. I see. That was, that was the first uh, concept of operation that I heard. And it was all because we were the only ones available. Um, the ships, as you briefed, those three ships, the aircraft carrier, Coral Sea, and the two destroyers were not going to be able to be in proximity to the island until the 15th. So if we went the 14th, we would have been doing it without any Navy support and with security policing. Over. Well, we'll um, we'll circle back to that and, and the use of security forces. It kind of when when that accident occurred on the 13th of May, it kind of revamped that it, it caused Seventh Air Force and the planners to go back and relook at that. Colonel Weichel, uh, Wanted to ask you, uh, could you help the audience understand the primary differences in the CH-53, the configuration, uh, their weapons and fuel as related to their mission role? Uh, uh, because they're, they were actually, uh, even though the aircraft are very, very similar and, uh, and, and the crews were very, very familiar with it, either or, there were significant differences in, in capability there. Could, could you elaborate on the differences in the HH-53 and CH-53? Uh, yeah, sure, Chief. Uh, of, of course, the, the CH-53, the, the, the big thing was that what is, it is not air-fueled. Uh, they originally had probes on the things until there was an accident uh, in the 21st SOS, and then it was decided, uh, I think they had damaged the, the probe, and they decided to take the probes off the aircraft. Uh, so, and, and their mission, the 21st SOS mission was, they were kind of the air assault and their air mobility arm for Vang Pal and the Laotian tribes and things like this. And so they were, they were mostly a, a CH cargo hauling outfit. And they used, they also had 650 gallon, not foam filled, but just regular 650 gallon drop tanks. And then their normal configuration without an air fueling probe. So they carried a little bit bigger fuel uh, supply uh, on board with, with the 650 gallon tanks. Whereas the rescue HH-53s had 450 gallon foam filled tanks. Of course, when you think about it, the, uh, the rescue HH-53's primary job was to fly up and pick up where fighter pilots that were shot down going supersonic up in North Vietnam. So they were more threat penetration uh, oriented to fly long ranges with air fuelings, duck bucks, and to be able to range as far as the fighters did. 
and uh, they were also uh, prepared to, to face a heck of a lot of hostile fire all the time because obviously the, uh, where the fighter guys were shot down was a heavily opposed operation to try to extract them. So the HHs also had a thousand pounds of armor plate. Besides, they carried three Gatling guns. The CHs normally carried only two Gatling guns, one up by the crew entrance door and then also one by the left on the left side uh, window. They usually didn't carry a ramp gun. Uh, but that's primarily because their cargo role, they would do rapid onloads and offloads and air assaults and moving vehicles around and on and off the aircraft. Uh, that's, but the rescue birds had a tail gun, a Gatling gun on the tail as well as up front, plus a thousand pounds of armor plate, plus self sealing 450 gallon tanks, plus the ability to air refuel. That was the big difference between the two airplanes. I see. And, and, and I appreciate that explanation. Uh, uh, Colonel Weichel, yeah, you know, one thing is important for the audience to understand uh, on the 21st uh, SOS uh, night birds, you actually had two flight mechanics or flight engineers. Uh, there were no pair of rescue assigned to the 21st Special Ops Squadron. They were all assigned to the 40th, uh, which uh, uh, the PJs actually acted as gunners and air crew members. So a little bit crew configuration, a little bit different uh, way of doing business. Uh, I, I, I kind of wanted to caveat that for you. Uh, General, General Comer, uh, could you please help the audience understand, uh, please explain the situation for the initial SOT on a rescue mission. How was it determined who had what role and why? You know, why did the Nightbirds have the assault? I think you touched on it earlier, but more importantly, had, uh, had this joint force done any operational missions or done any operational training uh, uh, with anyone uh, in the past, uh, could uh, could you touch on that, please? Sir? The answer to that is very simple. No, there was uh, no joint training with any of these units. We had not trained even with the security policemen uh, to do anything to insert them someplace because their job was to do air base security. Right. Our uh, we'd never seen the Marines. Uh, those those guys showed up and uh, on the ramp on the 14th while we were waiting for a go order to execute the mission and each helicopter had the security policeman beside the helicopter waiting for a, a launch order as the mission was delayed so we were hanging around on the ramp on the 14th from six o'clock in the morning until about three in the afternoon, Same. thinking the go order could come at any time. In the middle of that time was when uh, a group of Marines showed up at my aircraft and uh, another guy who was from the command staff, uh, makeshift command staff here in the uh, base ops building, they came out and told the security policemen they were relieved of the mission and the Marines took over. And that happened while we were sitting on the ramp out there waiting for a go order and immediately, you know, got with one of the Marines, a lieutenant, and said, here's what we think we're being told to do. What are you being told to do? <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, he said, well, we, we got live ammunition and we just got here from Okinawa. And I said, well, here's what we've been told to do. Um, put you at that point in time, the, the, the first three HHs mission was to take troops to the Mayagas, the ship itself, hover over top of the containers on the deck and let the troops get out of the helicopter by jumping out of a hovering helicopter onto those onto those uh, containers. containers, right? And uh, they uh, were probably gonna have to jump out the door uh, or, or the ramp. And we, didn't, we didn't want them to do that because we hovered so tail low and the uh, tail rotor blades would be right in their way as they would get off the ramp. Right. So we thought the door was the right way to go. And they would be go jumping out one at a time onto this thing and then we didn't know what opposing force might be on the ship. Uh, we told them we'd give them as much cover as we could since we had three helicopters, right? Somebody could put their guns on them. Right. Uh, while we were offloading one of the helicopters. That, that was the plan that day and, and the island would be taken care of by the 21st SOS. 
And then we would take up a SAR orbit out there near the island uh, after that. That was the initial brief for the people who got there on the night of the 13th, 14th, and were going to go out on the mission that day if it was executed on the 14th. I was part of those crews. Gary and his crew replaced my crew on that aircraft that we had when they came down. I think you guys came down on the C-130, didn't you? Uh, yeah, the Kingbird Browser. Gary. And, uh, and that, um, you know, that was the end of the day of the 14th. They displaced our crew. We had been up all night to get there and we'd been out on the ramp all day. And they said, we're replacing your crew with these fresh guys. And then a couple of hours later, the mission was scrubbed until tomorrow, the 15th. Right. Uh, but the, the crew assignments, the aircraft remain the same as they were that afternoon. Uh, uh, Colonel Michael, uh, you have anything to add on this perspective? I, I in, in fact, some people are, are not familiar with the technology in 1975. Why, why did we attempt to do this in the daytime? Uh, Sante was done at night. Why did we attempt to do this in the daytime? Was it, uh, could, could, could you briefly touch on that? Well, as, as uh, General Conger pointed out, uh, since nobody had practiced doing anything together in the daytime, it was going to be immensely harder to do it at nighttime if we hadn't even done it once in the day. Right. Uh, now, uh, Rich was, and I was a night recovery system qualified aircraft commander myself at this time, but it, that was only a couple of aircraft. I mean, there's only, we were using first generation night vision goggles at that time. Uh, and it was, it was like a single ship type of an operation. The whole idea when you're doing an air assault is to mass your force and to put it on the objective as quickly as possible. So that nobody in the CH-53s, uh, half the 40th ARRS were, were not qualified to be able to do this. As I say, it's more, the night recovery system was designed to pick up a single down fighter pilot or so at a time. A single ship that wasn't designed for a multi-ship operation so that was one of the reasons why it was done at first light and that's why we took off at four in the morning on the 15th to try to arrive at the island just right at the nautical twilight began to where we would have some cover particularly on the way down which didn't turn out to be too good anyway since we were fired at as we were going on the way down by a ship out in the, in, in the gulf of cyan uh, but at, at any rate so and that was still at night, and then it was just twilight breaking whenever we uh, got to the IP uh, just to the north of the island when everybody broke off. But that was primary reason. We hadn't done it before, and the technology at the time was only conducive to doing it uh, with on a very limited amount on, on a single air, H-53, and certainly not in a formation or a formation assault that would have been required uh, to, uh, to, do, to take out the island. Uh, Colonel Weichel, I, uh, now, now that I've got you, I, I'd like for you to uh, go into a little bit of depth. Uh, Chelsea, uh, if, if, if you could throw up a map of, of Kotang Island uh, I, uh, for a perspective for the audience, if you could uh, actually do that for us. Uh, there was an eastern beach assault and a western beach assault. And basically, uh, between the east and west, that, that small area was about uh, 1,100 feet. Uh, between you with the ridge line uh, that 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 separated east. Uh, some of, some of the force were doing the insertions on the west. Uh, clearly, they were waiting for us uh, for for our folks on the eastern beaches where we took uh, the knife aircraft took most of the licking. Uh, what were your initial thoughts there, Colonel Weichel, when when this began and it seemed okay at first, but it got progressively worse real quick. Well, Chief, uh, once again, our, our job is as soon as we got to the initial point, our, 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 our point with, as flight lead was over for that flight. And so the CHs broke off and headed towards the island. And then uh, the three of us, uh, the first three Jolly Greens, headed off towards the, the Holt to try to figure out how in the hell we were going to get these Marines on the Holt. As you could probably see from pictures, uh, the 53 is a damn almost the size of the Holt. I'm, that's an exaggeration, but it, the Holt was in, in no way, shape, or form an aviation capable ship for an aircraft the size of an H 53. All right. So, as we did that, so we headed off towards the, the, the ship. And as we figured out how uh, to, to get by putting the nose landing gear on the deck 
and make sure that they, uh, they came out the crew entrance door instead of out the ramp, which would fall into the sea. Uh, we were able to get them out uh, through the crew entrance door and, and hand down their weapons to them. Of course, managing to shock the living crap out of the flight engineer every time because we weren't grounded. We were generating all that static discharge. Right. Uh, so while this was going on, we were starting to listen to on the Fox mic on all the, all the radios to all the yelling and screaming going on on the radios. We knew things right away were turned into a shit sandwich there on the East Beach. I mean, a guard frequency, guard the beepers going off. There's, it was obvious from listening to all the, uh, the joint frequencies that we had that things were going terrible on, on both beaches and all the chaos and all the discussion uh, on all four, four or five radios that we had it's, uh, to include guard channels. Uh, so uh, so we, we pulled off the ship once we got our guys on. And then you've seen the photo that we took of the other bird, I believe, believe it was Jolly Green 1, 2 or for something I'm trying to remember, uh, Greer's airplane, that we had to head to the tanker right away. And we're listening to this the whole time and asking the tanker to get here as fast as he possibly could, uh, break through the cloud deck and, and let's, let's, let's tank up because we had low level lights on our 20 minute low level lights were on at that point. And so we didn't have any options to go help. So we got a quick, uh, we plugged in real fast, uh, filled up, and then uh, tried to sort out what the hell was going on. Where, where could we help? Uh, the, uh, the EC-130 cricket at that time, I believe was a call sign, said that there was a CH-53 that was flown by Terry Olemeyer and Dave Greer uh, that had lost an engine. Uh, they still had their Marines. They were unable to get their Marines in on the beach. And uh, we were to try to find them and help them. Well, we did spot them. They were limping along, flying pretty slow on single engine, being fully laden as well. And uh, we caught up with them. And then we flew formation with them. And then Jolly Green 1, 2, I believe, joined up with us at that point. And we began to slowly escort them back uh, towards, they thought they had enough fuel uh, to make it if that engine held out, right. uh, the single engine held out. And so um, they lost the, the other engine. They had basically did an auto rotation to trap Thailand, which is like one mile inside the Thai border from Cambodia at that time. And that's whenever we landed and picked up, uh, the two of us, 53s, landed and picked up the Marines. And that's where you saw the, the, the pictures that were taken okay. from our combat photographer of our aircraft, 364, 11, and uh, the other CH-53 that Olemeyer's flying, which is on the gate at Hurlburt Field as a pave low. I got it. Uh, uh, CSM, uh, Rick Lamb, I, I know you got a couple of questions you'd like to ask these gentlemen. To, uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and, and uh, ask away. And Randy, I, you, you know I do. Hey, gentlemen, it, it's an honor to meet you both. I mean, this is fascinating discussions. I, 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 I feel like a, a military historian sometimes. I mean, if you look behind me, I got all my stuff laid out. And uh, so I've been collecting kits since, uh, since I was a young man. And I, again, I, I find this fascinating discuss discussion. And again, I wanna thank you guys for, for all that you've done over two stellar careers. I mean, it, it was your generation of the, that grizzled combat vet that actually stepped into the gap following Vietnam and then trained my generation. And, uh, you know, cause we always have that awkward pause in between conflicts. And then we always flush all the lessons learned and then we stumble into the next engagement that nobody seems to predict. But I always remember as I was growing up, it was the combat vets like you guys that spent the remainder of your careers passing on hard lessons that ultimately saved lives to anybody who was smart enough to hear it and smart enough to listen to it. You know, so anybody within earshot, you had a, you had a, a, a you saved their lives. And uh, so again, you gave us a leg up on the next adversary. So again, I'd like to thank you for that. And many of your lessons, again, were combined with those from Eagle Claw, which was the first mission I was on in 1980, and then followed by Urgent Fury in 1983. And so it was the, the lessons of Kotang, Eagle Claw, and Urgent Fury that forced the creation of, uh, of the U.S. Special Forces, or U.S. Special Operations Forces that, uh, that we feel today, and, and they are the best in the world at what they do. And uh, so again, my fear is that we're entering into a similar post-conflict phase now, and then this current generation is going to have to pick up the mat your mantle and, uh, and, and then, again, step into that breach. So, again, thanks for driving this home. I appreciate it. Now, now, now General Comer, you, 
you were forced to improvise. I mean, you, your whole story is just improvising and adapting as, as a young lieutenant. That is, that's awesome. That is stellar. So uh, what, what, was the, what was the most memorable or impactful adaptation that you remember doing? Well, I mean, just, you know, trying to work it out on the ramp there with the Marines was, was, was kind of interesting. It was, it was a lesson, you know, they got completely different things to think about. We were a rescue squadron. Gotcha. Uh, and I, we never carried troops like that. So warp, walking through what they would want and all of those things and hearing from them was pretty doggone important. It was the first time I ever heard anything from them about, you know, we want you to land in this direction. We want you to turn the tail. We'll want you to do this. When they looked at the terrain and the pictures we had of the island, all of those things that they would want, we would build into our plan. But those, uh, but there were so many other things, Rick. The, um, a number of our guns didn't work. Uh, they were electrical, electric mini guns, and several of them didn't work, or the batteries were worn out. I remember Gary's aircraft was looking for a battery there for, uh, when you came back to the ramp. And we, we were at, in Thailand at that time, we had no live fire ranges. We were never able to exercise our guns in a live fire. And that is a big lesson. The other lesson was you got to have your guns with you. Um, you know, some aircraft were flying down there without their guns and they were waiting for them to be airlifted down there on a C-130. And that was, that was not satisfactory. Later in life, I saw airlift uh, when we went to Saudi Arabia for Desert Shield, um, we had a 141 that was going to bring on everything over, and they put all the guns in the 141. The 141 was canceled when General Schwarzkopf entered into the airlift, and so we went we went on our C5s to Saudi Arabia to be CSAR, and we were there for a month before we had guns. And that uh, that's unsatisfactory those kinds of things. Uh, you gotta make sure your stuff works, you gotta exercise it. And you gotta know how to work it as part of your daily life. Uh, everything you might need to do. We had never seen ships before. Uh, we had never trained for seeing ships. I, I think that before we went to the Saigon evacuation, they gave us a briefing on what signals we might see from a guy running around with a yellow jack. That was, that was the extent of our shipboard knowledge. Um, and that, I mean, those were kinds of things. After action report of the, my guess was the reason soft aircraft always had to maintain shipboard uh, qualification and currency. So the, there were a lot of things that just were, how do you work together? You need to practice that. and. The Navy needs to expect the Air Force to sometimes show up with their aircraft. Uh, and today they do that with the Army aircraft. Uh, that's, that seems fundamental now, but it wasn't at that time. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. How, how about you, Colonel? Well, as uh, I think we've we talked about, you know, just how simple it would have been if we had just realized you could put a rope on the damn <laughs> aircraft and just go down like a fire pole. <laughs> uh, and of course, that came to us in 1980, right? Uh, uh, so, so if we just had that, and the fact that five years later we were flying night vision goggles, doing ship operations and ship assaults and doing everything at night and learning the lesson uh, that we tried to, we tried to apply, for example, in the, well, in many places, Panama being one, uh, is that you don't go anywhere unless you have a night, unless you have an AC-130 with you. I mean, that's, you know, the AC-130 was kind of a new thing for us. Uh, first of all, it was super highly classified. Uh, and we had started to work with it in, in a rescue type of a scenario. We realized it had some extraordinary capabilities. And 
And, it, it, and the night before, either on the 13th or 14th, there was an AC-130 down at the island that accounted something like 50 campfires on the island and passed that information back to the Tuwok. Now, so we were kind of thinking, well, if there's only 13 people on that island, what the hell have they got 50 campfires going on? These must be the most scared of the night people there ever was. Or there's a hell of a lot more people on this island. But that word, that information never got back until later. And how that AC-130 information wasn't relayed through the intel networks to us. So, you know, it's kind of like weather. And the weather was wrong. So you don't trust the weather, you don't trust Intel, you go prepared for the worst possible case. And part of that is taking your friends with you. And if that friend happens to be an AC-130, uh, we tried to always make sure that our big friend, the AC-130 went with us almost everywhere else. And uh, I think that led to a lot of success over the years. And the times that I, uh, for example, that I think I wish the AC-130 had gone with the force was like in Mogadishu there. I, I was just going to say that, sir. I was on the ground in Mogadishu. We sure, we sure could have used that thing. <laughs> yeah, I think there have been a lot fewer skinnies running up and down the street shooting you guys with that angle. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, thank you. Hey, hey, gentlemen, the, uh, what emotions did you experience? I mean, I, I know it must have been frustrating, the, uh, you know, the, the attempts to cover, recover the dead, the wounded, to evacuate the remaining Marines. But I, I know that was a long day of flying. Where you had to go back and, and, and refuel and, and come back in. I mean, what, what, do you, what do you guys pull like 12, 14, 16 hours of just non stop butt in the seat? I mean, you must have been in, in, in the crushing enemy fire the whole time. So you guys had to be exhausted. And I mean, and, and you're making decisions under that pressure. So what, what, uh, what was that like? Well, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, we so I, I'm pretty sure we flew 14.7 hours, of which uh, about an hour or so of it was as uh, riding as uh, back of Jolly Green 1 1 whenever uh, Barry Walls and Rich Comer took over right on the ship there at the very end. But for the other 12 over 12 hours that we uh, we were in the seats, we didn't get out of the seats. Uh, uh, the only time it, it was just it was such a, a huge cluster without using the last word uh, that that there's something crazy going on all the time trying to sort out where the hell the people were who was doing what uh, with uncontrolled aviation coming through there uh, f-111 streaking in on the eastern side of the island dropping 2,000 pound bombs and we were wondering what the hell are they doing and uh, of course they are getting in the way and uh and, and then f4s racing through uncontrolled the island uh missing the island with bombs uh we where was the a7 where where were our sandies that we were used to flying with when we were doing rescue type of scenarios uh there was an ac-130 out there uh what was he doing uh and, and if we could have just organized some of this and then finally the ov-10 shows up the ov-10s Nail six, eight, and six, nine, uh, Bob Undorf in particular, and Rick Rohr Casey. Uh, later in the afternoon, that really helped kind of begin to calm things down to get things sorted out. Uh, but of course, we were running out of time. Uh, and we were always in an improvisational mode. We, so once we were heading back and we, we had the crew uh, from the, uh, from, and the Marines from the, the initial early morning thing, we picked them up, went back to Utapau and picked up more Marines and headed back to the island to do a West Beach assault. Uh, things were just chaos all the time. So now we are sitting there with Jolly Green 1-2 on our wing. Now we're, we are loaded up with the Marines. We're going to assault the West Beach. We, we start the run in on the West Beach. We're right on the water tops going 170 knots in, four, in, a, in, a, in a flying wing assault formation. And we're probably a mile out. And all of a sudden, here's this huge geyser of water that goes up right in front of us. And we're over a mile out. We're going, what the hell are these guys shooting at us? We're getting this fire this far out. Well, thank we went through the spray from that, that big impact that was right in front of our aircraft. And we did the assault on the island. We got our people off. And then one, two went back uh, with wounded after his assault. And I think that's where Rich and Barry picked uh, up the aircraft later. Uh, and then later, we, as, we're, as we took off, and, and we're, now we're heading back to the tanker, one, one is. We're looking at the, the USS the Wilson there, and we realize the Wilson's shooting at the east beach of the island, and what he was doing is he's skipping five-inch rounds over the island, and that was a round that hit near us coming in, 
And, and we were going, Ooh, boy, that, that's a relief. We, we thought the bad guys had five inch guns and were shooting at us. And had no, no wonder we're getting our ass handed to us. And we're uh, taking rounds like this, but it was actually our own friendly round coming across. The but it was chaos and, and it was a makeup thing all along. And after we covered that, then after we tried to cover uh, Wayne Purser in 4 3 and Gradle, uh, and they got shot up, uh, and they, then they were single engine. They had lost a hydraulic system. And, uh, and now we have to figure out what they can't make it back. They had holes in their fuel tanks. They couldn't get back. So what are we going to do with, so we're going to have to prepare to extract rescue them and the water landing. But then Backlund and I started talking. I said to Backlund, I said, hey, Don, do, do, do you remember that there's supposed to be a large aviation ship out here somewhere, not these little dinky destroyers? And he goes, yeah, Duke, I remember something like that. So I got on the horn and called the Kingbird, and I said, hey, uh, look at that big radar on that King. Let's see if he can figure out that there's somebody else out here. So I called the King, and I said, do you see something that looks like a ship out there on that radar? Do you have the capability to do that? And he said, hold on a second. And the navigator comes back, and he says, there's either a thunderstorm out here about 40 miles to the south, or it's a big ship coming. Well, we had no other choice. Uh, so we're going to head towards the big thunderstorm or the ship, whatever the hell it was out there. In the meantime, here comes the Kingbird that tries to air fuel a single engine 53 that can't make 100 knots. And twice the Kingbird almost stalled out and he did stall out and he had to go throttles full forward as he lost control. And he was dragging baskets across with all four engines firewalled, trying to pull out of that against the over the tops of the sea. He did that twice to try to air fuel that stricken H-53. After that was over, we we're going, okay, we're committed. We're going to have to hope that this is a ship out here. And it turned out it was a USS Coral Sea. And so that's the kind of, of making it up as you go along type of crap that was going on. We, we were just trying to figure out how to, as the late great Bill Tackett said, we're trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Well, and again, based on the introductions, you guys are both lieutenants at this time, right? I was very senior first lieutenant. I, 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 I would try from here on out to not talk trash about lieutenants anymore. <laughs> I, I was ex enlisted though. So okay, right, there you go. <laughs> well, let me throw let me throw out this: is this was a remote tour to Thailand, wherein the war was over. Okay, and so everybody being assigned out there was getting coming straight out of flight school. And there were a few others like Barry Walls, who was my crew commander, who were grabbed out of other aircraft, sent through H-53 school and sent over there to be the aircraft commanders because they had more flying time. Wow. Even though it wasn't in H-53s. Uh, Wayne Purser was on his third flight as an aircraft commander on the Mayagas and he, he ends up with an Air Force Cross, uh, flying that aircraft that went single engine, landed on the ship. Uh, uh, a chief petty officer, Navy guy, hacks all the fuel line apart and put a piece of rubber hose on it to replace the fuel line, taped it with duct tape. And he said, I think, you'll, I think your engine will work. Well, Purser ends up with that aircraft, with that fuel line, Wow! Uh, depending on that. And he picked up 54 Marines off the island there at the dark off the West Beach when it was desperate to get those guys off the beach uh, in the dark. That is and incredible. so, uh, I mean, that's, that, that was an incredible feat. Um, Barry and I, we got out there. Barry was a, a C-141 airlift guy who was sent over to Thailand for one year in helicopters to be an aircraft commander. He was the odd duck around there. He was a captain. Uh, there were, uh, you know, uh, Gary's crew was both first lieutenants. Um, there were, there must have been six crews uh, that I can think of on the jolly side that were all lieutenants, first and second lieutenant. As the two as the two pilots, none none of us had combat time, and I mean the, the even the captains like Purser and and Walls, who were our aircraft commanders, they they had less helicopter time than I did. 
Wow. So it was, uh, I mean, there, it was kind of a, that was how, that was how they were manning a remote tour squadron at that time when there's no war. That is flat so, out. And when you're talking about making it up as you go along, we had no, we didn't have a lot of mentors around. True. Hey, well, let me, let me ask you, both you guys, uh, how about after the mission, when it was over, it's winding down. Um, I, I see you remember that uh, everybody left. You thought everybody's off the island. I mean, what, what was going through your head, like post, post assault, post mission? In my case, I got home, you know, with the aircraft that Gary was on. Uh, my crew, because we had less time out there after our part on, at the island and our aircraft was all shut up and our flight engineer was wounded. Uh, we got in Gary's aircraft to fly back to Utapau and we took their crew back and their flight engineer acted as our flight engineer. When we all flew back to Utapau, we got there, it must have been 1030 at night. and. Um, there was a party kind of going on at the club, but I uh, I remember talking to the ADO, Vern Sheffield, and he said, well, you're gonna need engine runs in the morning. Would you go to bed and get me out here at seven? And I said, okay, so I went to sleep. And all day on the 16th, I was with the maintenance guys out on the flight line, our maintenance officer, guy named Rainer Buckley. We got to know each other real well that day because I was on the flight line for less than 12 hours that day. And we started hearing about the possibility that there were Marines still on the island and we needed this mount up aircraft to go. So that, there was a lot of sense of urgency on the flight line while the maintenance guys were working aircraft. And I was doing the engine runs to certify that the aircraft were ready to go. And instead of just doing an engine run to check the maintenance, I was doing engine runs to cock them on alert, um, and which would be a big deal for a crew to trust some second lieutenant to say, everything's fine on this aircraft. Just use the scramble checklist and you can take off in two minutes. Uh, that was, you know, trust me, uh, that, was, that was kind of improvised as well. Right. Uh, when uh, Michael, back, go ahead. I, I got back uh, there, we wanted to open the bar. I, uh, and we were just trying to figure out who, who was coming back. We were, that was kind of a collection point. It was late. And uh, most of us hadn't had any sleep in like almost two days, uh, but we we're tired. We we're fired up. We knew things were a mess. Uh, we wanted to see who was coming and who wasn't, who did we lose out of all that chaos? Because we all knew each other in the 21st and the 40th. We all knew each other very well. Uh, we'd all been flying together in previous assignments. Uh, I was flown with, uh, with the Jim Case at that point, John Lucas. I'd flown with all of them, either when I was flying Hueys and uh, Huey gunships or, or here over in Southeast Asia. We wanted to see who was going to be there. It was a somber time. It wasn't a wild yaha type of a thing or anything else. It was just trying to collect our thoughts and Backland and Phil Pacini and myself and others were standing there and we were absolutely convinced I think probably Vern Sheffield was too at some point Uncle Vern and we were saying we got to go back there's got to be somebody we left behind uh, we just as uh, we mentioned you we, we just there's too many disjointed operations too many people scattered over too many ships too many LZs East Beach, West Beach, who's on whose airplane? Uh, uh, you, I mean, it, it was just chaos and pandemonium. So we were prepared. We were talking already about how we could scrounge up maybe, what, what number of aircraft could we scrounge up? We knew they'd have to be HHs because the CHs were all completely shot to pieces. At, at least we could air a fuel on the HHs and we could get down there. We wouldn't need a lot of support. And then and, and the ships were still there. So we thought we need to go down there, at least make our presence known so that if anybody needs to make a swim for it or something, we'll at least be there to be able to, to do something. Uh, but, and we kept this up and we kept this up and, I, and, and it was probably the next morning 
uh, maybe about mid morning, uh, and we were playing. Well, we were planning on launching actually uh, fairly early in the morning uh, to, to get down to the island around noonish, uh, and we were told to stand down. Uh, we were we, the word had come back from the first out, uh, probably the first out, fifty six out DO, I believe it was the Colonel Edens or whatever his name was, Anders Anders uh, that that the Marines had uh, had counted for all of their personnel. And so we, we said, well, okay, gosh, that was really fortunate, uh, given all that chaos and pandemonium. And that turns out that there were three guys in that M60 crew left behind. Uh, hard to get over that, you know. So at any rate, so that's kind of what happened. And, and that was kind of the, the reaction that we had. But we had three, at least three birds we were going to get going and that we knew that could go down there. And we were, we were, going to, we were ready to roll at that point. Uh, we were just waved off by higher headquarters. I've been to a couple of the Marine reunions uh, of the, the Cotang Beach Club that they call themselves. I've been a couple of their reunions. They all are uh, almost uh, still always in mourning for those three Marines. Right. But, you know, get it. You know, here it is, 10 o'clock at night. Everybody just got off the island. Some of them are on the Holt. Some of them are on the Wilson. Some of them are on the Carrier. Some of them have been taught, brought back to Utapau. And they're trying to do head counts. And everybody's, every one of the, uh, uh, the intermediate commanders uh, said, yeah, all my guys are here. All my guys are here. And so they took those counts and said, everything's OK. But I don't know how they lost that three-man uh, gun crew. But that, you know, they all, uh, they spend uh, quite a lot of time mourning those three guys at every one of their reunions. Well, they it still affects them very, very strongly. Right. Uh, gentlemen, uh, one question I'd like to, uh, to ask you is, it, it's very important because it influenced me personally. Uh, you know, this, this entire experience, when you, you walked away as a lieutenant and as you became majors, lieutenant colonels, commanders, uh, and, 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 and I, I definitely don't want to underestimate that, that impact uh, that it had on your decision making. Uh, and, and, and we'll start with no one left behind uh, that became our mantra in the special ops community. Uh, General Comer, I'll start with you and your perspective of, of how that changed you. Well, the thing that it became very clear to me throughout my career was if I was in a flying job, I better be ready because some wild call can come and you got to go and right. you got to figure out something to do to get that mission done. So the first and foremost thing is readiness and training that is realistic and that uh, does uh, get you ready for whatever might come up. Now, the first mission of Desert Storm, you know, when we uh, flew Pathfinder for the Apaches, that was something we had never done. But we rehearsed it during Desert Shield probably about 15 times. Big and yeah. we had, um, you know, we had a lot of things to work out. We had to marry up our communications. We had to figure out formation. Now we each flew our formations, how to signal each other, how to do it come out, how to do all kinds of things how to get out of the way when the uh, Apaches are gonna start shooting and how to make sure that the navigation is perfect so that they can find their target at that time. We were the only aircraft there with GPS uh, installed in our navigation program and GPS was literally brand new. It went right, from two right. hours, we went from two hours of coverage during Desert Storm to 22 hours of coverage because the Space Command put everything in the, in the sky during Desert Storm or Desert Shield 
because that's when it came up. But there are all kinds of things about readiness. You know, somebody can put up satellites for the GPS, but if you haven't taught yourself how to use it, you, you're not ready. So we needed to teach ourselves how to use it on that two hours a day that we had before we ever got over there. So as soon as you've got a capability, you got to get everybody qualified in it and you got to make sure you're ready to do it. Right. And then whatever comes up, you can, you can flex with it. Right. And that's, you know, you got to be, you got to be flexible. Something's going to come up. That's so weird. You can't figure out if, if it doesn't fit into your, your paradigms, you got to break a new paradigm. That's all. That's, there is to that's it. important. Uh, I, I appreciate that, uh, General Comer. Uh, Colonel Weichel, I, I know you hammered a lot of stuff into us as well. Uh, it, it, there it, things that we're going to do no matter what. And, uh, and, and that philosophy uh, pushed over into your command. Uh, would you care to comment on how this impacted you? Uh, sure, Chief. I, I don't, like Rich was saying, uh, you know, war, warfare is always a messy thing. You, 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 you just can't plan on doing, having some rope mission and it's going to be going this way all the time. You have to be prepared for anything. So as you know, uh, with our joint partners, we did lots of what apparently were what appeared to be crazy things. We would do uh, kind of prisoner of war assaults on the Air Force Academy. Right. Uh, with with SEAL Team Six, we would do stuff with Delta. We on the POW compound. I mean, we we got used to going to different things and challenging ourselves. Uh, but like Rich says, we uh, we made sure we were ready the whole time. And then, of course, when we go to Panama, for example, you know, our primary mission was scrubbed, and I ended up carrying Pete Schoomaker around while we we're doing their things. And then we're the and we're hauling Delta guys to this place. We're hauling SEALs this place, and then we're hauling Rangers putting 60 Rangers on a bird, each of three airplanes, and we're going to try to reinforce the U.S. Embassy downtown in Panama City. It's a pickup game. This turns into a pickup game. So you, you got to be flexible. You got to be able to think on your feet, but you have to have this hardcore of readiness that, that's behind all this stuff, and you're willing to adapt. And that's one of the great things about the American fighting man it, that characterized us and, and helped us win in World War II is the ability... Whenever GI Snuffy was out there and he finds himself way beyond his line of communication with his leadership, he improvises and figures out how to do something well. That always threw the Soviets. They never could handle the improvisation that the average American GI would do. So we had to reflect that. And I think we did in our, in our flying. Uh, and the other last thing that I'll say is uh, one of the lessons I learned from the my guest. <clears throat> I have to be a little bit gentle about this. The, the senior leadership of the 40th Rescue Squadron was, in my mind, nowhere to be found. Uh, the fact that we had, had lieutenants out there uh, making decisions the way that we did, and, and a few handful of captains, one or two captains, mostly all lieutenants. And the 21st did have their leadership out there. I take my hat off to them. Uh, John Denham and, and Corson knew what was going on because they were in the lead. So I decided from that point on that I was going to honor the, the World War II people that I find the heroes when the wing commanders and squadron commanders flew lead in all the bomber and the fighter formations. You know what in the hell's going on when you're leading and you're out front. You don't know what in the hell's going on when you're sitting back at the, head, the HQ tent painting the rocks white. You know, you, you need to be out there with your guys. So you know what their standards of training are. You, you challenge them yourself. And as you know, I got in a lot of trouble when I was a commander from certain leadership because I was flying 60 hours a month while I was a commander. And I was told that I was supposed to have a desk job and, and do more of the paperwork of being a commander. Well, I never bought that. You know, I, that's the reason I flew 60 hours a month. And of course, it helped that we were training so many people at, this, uh, at any one time to bring the force up to speed. But at any rate, those are the lessons I learned. Lead from out front. Make your people ready for anything. Have them practice all kinds of improvisational things and challenge them in ship operations and ship assaults and things like that. So we, we expanded our horizons of mission capabilities 
And then, of course, that also drove uh, a lot of this drove whenever I had the ability to help build the pave low 53J and, and M and others. A lot of these lessons learned, uh, we, we incorporated into these aircraft, how to make them more survivable, how, how, to, how to make them more combat effective, how to make them pen better penetrators, more reliable. So you didn't have to worry about batteries for Gatling guns for that matter, the AC drive minigun, right? So, uh, I mean, we learned lots of lessons make stronger, more powerful engines and rotor blades and transmissions that would take battle damage and keep ticking. Uh, crash worthy fuel cells uh, so that they wouldn't blow up when they're hit and they would also protect the aircraft and crew it, instead of being a, a firebomb liability like we saw in the Maya guess. You know, we learned lots of lessons and to do it at night. You know, don't, <laughs> right. Don't, right. I mean, come on, the Marines and the Army learned the hard way in the, in the Pacific Island Wars and assault on islands is a bitch. You know, and we just proved it all over again that assault on an island is a bitch. Right. Nowhere to hide. And when you got to hide behind a destroyer like we did on that one photograph that we sent in, and then all of a sudden you go over the top of him, you're, you, you do a high, hard deceleration and flip it around on the beach, you're there for the whole world to shoot at. And make sure you're with Gatling guns work. <laughs> right. Hey, hey, Ray, if, I, if I could make one last comment, I mean, gentlemen. Sure, you, sure. We, go ahead, Ray. We've got to scream these lessons from the rooftops during this post-Afghan lull because there's always a propensity to cut budgets and take a knee. And, uh, and then that forces the next generation to relearn these lessons. And we just can't let that happen. Yeah. So again, thank you, gentlemen, both of you. This is fascinating. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Chelsea, could you please put up the memorial slide for everyone? Thank you so much. Uh, to the listeners and our guests, at the end of this operation, there were 41 KIA and or MIA of what many historians simply refer to as the SS Maguez incident. Also marked the end of an era and the very last combat action reflecting in our involvement in Southeast Asia. Displayed are the, those names for all to remember and the ultimate sacrifice they paid during this mission for their country. Could we please pause for a brief moment of silence in respect to the fallen, their friends and families. Thank you. Chelsea, do we have some questions for the audience uh, for, for our guests to answer? Yes, we have a couple questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, first question, a lot of people talk about Eagle Claw in terms of the formation of SOCOM and the Goldwater Nichols Act of 86. Do you think that this operation had any impact on those actions as well? Uh, let me take that one on if I can. Um, absolutely. Uh, when, when you take a look at the congressional patrons that, that formed U.S., that drove the formation of U.S. SOCOM, those congressional patrons were, that, that were proposing uh, uh, the, uh, the formation of SOCOM, which uh, SOCOM was unanimously opposed by almost all of DOD, and it was formed by, by key leaders in, in Congress, particularly the, the Chairman Dan Daniel, Earl Hutto, uh, and also their head congressional staffer, professional staffer, who was also CIA and, and SF commander, with Ted Lunger. And so they reviewed this operation. Uh, th this was all part of the, their archival knowledge and the understanding that things weren't right in special operations. Whenever you have a pickup game like the Maya guess, the SS Maya guess, and, and then a few years later, then you had a, a, another pickup game with Eagle Call, where you, lots of people were coming together, communications issues, the, the joint force issues, overly complex and complicated missions, inadequate intelligence. The usual thing, they, they absolutely were, this, this was a data point, Eagle Claw was a data point, and then also as, as Rick, uh, he was at the Grenada, they also viewed the special operations participation in Grenada to be less than successful. And a lot of that was driven by, they need, so that they determined that the services could no longer be trusted, if you will, uh, with with uh, putting together their own service pieces of special operations and have to come together in a joint fashion, which it really needed to be. 
So absolutely, uh, the, 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 the Mayagas was one of their first data points. Uh, of course, even further back, Sante in 1970 was a data point because it went kind of well. The only trouble was is it took so damn long to get it off the ground that they, they had moved the POWs. But the point is, there was a nexus of something good. So, so, and then in 75, this pickup thing happened, and then they disbanded soft, and they just pretty much disbanded rescue after the Maya guess. Then they had to put it all back together again in 1979 and 80. And then it, they, then it kind of has fallen apart again. And, and there are a lot of service activities that were, uh, that were not funding special operations and counterterrorism to that point. And not, that led in 1983. And that's when they finally had enough of it in 1984, five and six. And that's when they formed SOCOM. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. I, 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 could, I could go into more detail at some other point if you need it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Chelsea, do we have another uh, question for perhaps General Comer might be able to answer? Uh, this one came a little earlier in the broadcast, so it's a little more technical question about the aircraft. Um, one of the listeners wanted to know what is included in the night recovery system for the oh, aircraft? Okay. Yeah, the, the night recovery system or NRS, and we renamed it not really safe. <laughs> uh, we had uh, it had an approach coupler and a hover coupler and it all worked off of a Doppler radar system um, and uh, that and, and of course we did have those uh, it, it Gen like 1 you. goggles right. the idea was the approach coupler would take control of the aircraft, bring the nose up, do the approach uh, for you in the dark and bring you to a place where you could engage below 30 knots. You could then engage the hover coupler and then the hover coupler worked on a little stick that you had on the side of the seat and it gave you 10% uh, control uh, moving the aircraft forward, half left, right while the aircraft then continued to descend down to the setting that you had on your radar uh, altimeter and would descend to the radar altimeter altitude that would be hopefully treetop level. And we would do that, but the aircraft approach coupler was really inferior and it often just put the collective down to the floor. Uh, the, the nose would come up, the collective would go all the way down right, and stay down. And in the dark, that was not really safe. Uh, so, we, you know, we, didn't, we would usually keep our hand under the collective handle and keep it from going all the way down and try to nurse that thing so that it would actually complete the approach. But it so seldom worked that none of us trusted it, and it wasn't. Uh, it was just not really safe. Well, the yeah, technology yeah. wasn't there uh, it, quite ready yet. But that, yeah, the, the interest the was the a Doppler, precursor. The Doppler radar would blink yeah. into memory at least once or twice Absolutely. during the approach, and as soon as it blinked into memory, you were in auto rotation. You're right. And, uh, that was uh, that was a very uncomfortable feeling in the dark over top of the trees. Yes. Chelsea, do you have any more questions? Uh, we're, we're going a little bit extended. Uh, I think everything else has pretty much been answered since it was asked. So I think we're good with audience questions. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. Yes, uh, and, and I, I want to thank you again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the conclusion of Soft Stories Live. The SS Magua is in the 14 hours on Cotang Island. This is part one. Please join us for part two, where our guests will be represented by veterans of the Second Ninth Marines, actual combatants of the key force involved in this operation. Listen to their perspectives. We look forward to having them. To our guests, uh, General Comer, Colonel Weichel, on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation, I would like to extend heartfelt thank you for your service to our nation, candidly sharing your firsthand experiences with our viewers. It's been an honor to see you distinguished gentlemen today again and thank you for participating in today's discussion. We look forward to having you join us again. Until then, on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation, Soft Stories Live, thank you. Along with my co-host, CSM Rick Lamb, former Ranger and Special Forces Operator, I am the host, 
Chief Master Sergeant Randy Anderson, U.S. Air Force retired and Air Commando. Good afternoon and God bless America.